Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us um, for this webinar being hosted today by the Roundtable on Population Health Improvement as part of the series on bridging public health, healthcare, and community. And we're really delighted to have with us today Alison Girdle Rosenberg and Kate Blackburn and Bilal Taylor, um, all three from Nemours Children's Health System. And I think I will just uh, turn it over to uh, you guys. Great, thanks so much, Alina. Um, and really thanks so much to the Roundtable for um, inviting us today. I'm really excited to be here with Kate and Bilal um, to share what we've learned about integrative activities within population health networks. And um, I know we wanna cover quite a few things in this um, time together. So Kate, I think with the next slide, we're gonna share My, there it goes. There's a little delay. Thanks. So there's three of us and here's oh. what we want to cover today. <laughs> yeah. um, we want to talk to you a bit about um, summarizing our relevant prior work because we really want to contextualize today's content in a way that's helpful to, to you, whether you've heard us before or this is a new topic for you. We want to provide an overview of the Integrator Learning Lab and share a lot about all of the great people that we worked with in the communities that we had a chance to work with and the experts that we had a chance to bring together. Share examples of the types of achievements that networks made when they aligned integrative activities and strategic plans. Provide some detail on the tools within the labs um, that we used for coaching and technical assistance, including how they can be used in others in the field. A real goal here is for us to share how, even if you didn't participate with us in this learning lab, how you can use these tools benefit from these experiences. Um, and then of course, saving time for a discussion and questions and answers at the end. So as we begin, I'd also like to thank the Kresge Foundation um, and Nemours um, for their support of this work. Um, as we all know, the great work that we get to do is always enhanced when we get to great work with great partners. And certainly we've had the opportunity with the funding from the Kresge Foundation to really accelerate and to expand this work in an, in an ongoing way. Um, today's session is really a follow-up to the August 2020 webinar that we did for the round table um, that had the really long name that's on the screen um, that really focused on what are integrative activities and how can we accelerate their work. Um, I encourage you if you get a chance and are interested in learning more um, about what was covered in there to check out the recording of that but to also share with you that today we really want to focus on um, looking at spotlighting achievements of networks and thinking about how their participa participation in the Integrator Learning Lab illustrates the types of gains that are possible as a result of strategic alignment of integrative activities and network goals. That's a lot of words and we're going to dig into those words deeply over the next couple of slides. Um, but a bit about Nemours, um, since there's three of us today presenting. Um, from there, just to fill you in a little bit, we're a nonprofit pediatric health system, um, really focused on offering care in the Delaware Valley and Northern Central Florida. Um, I think what really makes us different is that in addition to um, doing life-changing medical care and research, and really 95, 98% of our colleagues are on the front lines, working with kids and families every day to provide incredible um, health care, we also have this great opportunity to focus on helping all kids, those who never cross our doors, um, to grow up healthy and to advocate for kids nationally on a number of health issues. And so the Nemours National Office of Policy and Prevention, which is where Kate, Bilal, and I are all seated at Nemours, really exists to support those items of helping all kids grow up healthy and advocating. So how do policy and practice work together? And so this work that we're gonna talk about today really fits into that as we think about how do we design systems that best support kids and families in achieving the goals around their health and well-being that they seek to achieve. And so I'm not gonna go through all of these um, bullets except to say we really see our role as a catalyst for change and how can we work with others to accelerate change across the spectrum, really taking into account what can be transformed in the health system, what are the so roles of social determinants of health, and how can we work with others to make this all come to reality? Um, but now a focus in on those words I promised you that we would focus in on. And I promise this is the only slide I will read to you um, because I know that's not fun, but I really think it's important for us to ground ourselves 
in this terminology as we will be using it a lot. So population health networks to us are partnerships that work intentionally and systematically across sectors to achieve shared goals specific to improved health and wellness outcomes for an entire geographically defined community. So what happens to all the people in a geography um, when networks come together? And what is the population health integrator within those networks or entities that have formally agreed to take on leadership and accountability, probably together, because we know that a lot of this cannot be done by one organization and definitely not one person, for specific integrative activities within the network as a means of supporting the goals. Um, we all know that unless you name it, unless you take responsibility for it, um, our to-do lists grow every day um, and things get pushed to the bottom. So really this is an attempt to focus on how do we take accountability within groups in order to move this work forward. And what are we taking responsibility and accountability for? Really these integrative activities. So they involve governance and oversight and administrative activities that really enable the cross-sector networks to carry out tasks and strategies related to the goals that they're seeking to achieve. Um, that'll mean a lot more as we go through the work and we hope to really bring it to life for you. And part of how we wanna bring it to life really has to do with bringing audio clips, the voices from our colleagues across the country that helped us do this work, that are doing this work on a daily basis um, throughout the session so that you can hear from them um, and not just hear from Kate, Bilal and I who just have the honor of sharing with you this great work. So here, a member of the DC Health Matters Collaborative, which is located in Washington, DC, um, Abby Evans reflects on the key role of integrators in really catalyzing the use of shared language, vision, and goals across sectors. I think we frequently speak the language of healthcare, but sometimes we really need to speak the language of equity or housing or food justice to make sure that we're meeting the community where they're at and other players that are all moving towards the same effort and make sure that we're speaking the same language and, and working towards the same goal. And we're all breathing a sigh of relief right now that technology works and that it will continue to work throughout this event. Um, but to give context for today's presentation, just a quick summary of some of our relevant work in this space. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through and summarize all of these um, errors, except to say that this is a body of work that goes back nearly a decade. Um, the work from 2018 to now is part of the current initiative, exploring the roles and functions of health systems within population health integrator networks. And the information we'll be sharing today is part of a broader body of lessons learned, insights and resources, which exciting, were released to the field today. Um, and we're gonna be sharing um, those resources with you um, now. And just so you know, um, we've also put the links to them in the chat. Um, but this screenshot, shows the collection of tools and resources that are available. They include a white paper offering insights and recommendations based on the Integrator Learning Lab, an updated framework of essential integrative activities, a collection of the tools and resources we used to provide technical assistance to networks in the labs. As we said, we really wanted to make those available broadly and we will be sharing more of those with you. Um, and then a collection of voices from the field videos which um, focus on four key areas, advice on being a strong network partner, tools and strategies to accelerate networks, strategies for putting health equity into action, and the benefits of creating a culture of learning in your network. And once again, those are bringing the voices from the field to you um, so that you can hear from the experts themselves on what is needed. The starred items that you saw there um, are really the most relevant to today's session, um, but all of the documents are relevant and reinforcing and we're excited to share them with you. So as I mentioned, the links are in the chat. Um, please feel free to check them out and to share any questions um, or comments as you review them and throughout this presentation. And with that, I am really excited to turn this over to my colleague Bilal. Thank you. Well, thank you much, Allison, and good afternoon. I see it's after three Eastern, so everyone on the line would be, at least in the United States, would be in the uh, afternoon here. So good afternoon to you. And as, Al as Allison said, we want to also move on to dig a little bit more further into this Integrator Learning Lab and what we're able to get done in 2020 in partnership with a great crew of 
multi-sector network partners as well as faculty. Um, and before you hear any more from me, why don't we go ahead and jump into another voice of one of our colleagues, really a phenomenal colleague, Allison Logan, uh, up in Bridgeport, Connecticut from Bridgeport Prospers, who works with the United Way of Coastal Fairfield County up there. And after we hear a few words from her about really the sort of mutually reinforcing activities we got done together last year, um, we'll continue the conversation. I think the biggest benefit for being an integrator first is to unsiloing people, right? I mean, that's the biggest thing is to get people out of their silos and really work together. But the second thing is, is that it really does uplift work from both sides. Well urged, Allison. And so hopefully, uh, you know, Allison and Allison, no, no, we didn't plan that that way. I both shared a little bit about, you know, some of the spirit of the lab, but why don't we dig a little bit deeper into who went with us on this journey? And so as you can see from the map here, the Integrator Learning Lab was really a product of us talking to partners, scanning the field, to try to find some local efforts, regardless of the type of work or the focus of your work. We're really, we're really looking at systems level change that could be done in partnership with healthcare, community-based organizations, and, and lifting up the voices of folks um, in the community primarily. So these were nine uh, multi-sector efforts across the country that came in, regardless of their individual efforts, they had a shared set of goals that they wanted to achieve together. But also, we very much wanted to work in the spirit of self-directed coaching, technical assistance, and uh, capacity building. So each of these groups in our group, uh, in our in our collaborative work together, which was initially going to be six months, with the COVID, with the uh, advent of the COVID pandemic uh, sort of hitting us in March, we had a chance to meet one time together in February, and then we all sort of know how our world changed in March. We're excited to say that most of our groups were able to stick and stay with us, continue to meet the needs that they had in their communities over what was planned to be a six month engagement. So it ended up being nine uh, glorious months together. Um, and yeah, so the 10 hours that they got from staff and uh, from our faculty really ended up having this multiplier effect. And we had so much synergy that we're excited to sort of share a little bit about with you as we dig deeper into the stories from the lab. Um, as Allison said, we won't try to read too much to the group, uh, but these there are a couple things I'd like to just sort of point out as we go to make sure we really um, share with you the individual um, pieces of the lab and the, and the focal points here, but as well as really giving a shout out to the folks that made it possible because there were, th there were three of us, three, four of us on our team, but there are dozens of folks that joined us to make this go. Um, so a few focal areas of the work, um, and there were faculty attached to each of these. One was really understanding integrative activities. This is a framework that sort of integrative activities was the water that folks were swimming in, but oftentimes when Alice mentioned naming and claiming, these were things that we sort of wanted to make explicit so that we could also begin to talk about, not in so much distinction to other models, but building on that sort of networked approaches, maybe you've heard from collective impact or other models, that these were sort of nodes you know, in different ways in which we saw sort of uh, interwoven integrators doing this work together. How are folks getting that work done across networks in complex ways? And we're glad that our partner from heaven and earth, uh, Sherry Mediato, was able to help us to think about how do you share those, um, those activities and, and, and sort of name them and claim them. A second area was really once we understand the range of activities it takes for a multi-sector partnership to do what it does, how do we think about the voices that often can be left out of this partnership? And that's always in, going to start with the voices of folks who some of us call people with lived experience, folks who have the sort of most direct experience of an individual issue um, or set of issues that a network came together to, uh, to sort of address. But also within partnerships, how do we make sure that we really maximize the expertise of each of the partners that are coming together? So if you have a community development financial institution, you have healthcare, you may have a college, you know, traditional eds and meds, how do they really all come together so that there's really a clear way forward and that they can share responsibility um, for this work? And again, one of our partners there that we're excited was the Visible Networks Lab that really helped us to push through um, with this work. Um, Another group, another area that we focused on was really equity strategies within population health. So even as you're thinking about a governance structure, how do we really bring that down to size a bit and make sure that on the ground, we're not just sort of retrofitting our work for equity, but that we really are thinking about how to include those voices. And sometimes that can even lead to conversations you aren't anticipating. I recall one of our groups talking about, you know, we're thinking about equity, but do communities really think of themselves in terms of medical conditions, et cetera? So one of our groups that stands out, they thought about 
about, hey, what are the uh, health and equity issues in the community? And some people said, hey, trash on our streets. Let's go there. So we saw the folks that have that flexibility to think about what does the community need? How do we sort of share data, but certainly not let that data drive the issue and really make sure we're starting um, from a community perspective. And again, one of our colleagues at Wellbeing and Equity in the World and connected to 100 Million Healthier Lives, Shoma Stout and Seth Fritz, really helped us to unpack that, as well as some of our partners down um, in DC at the Institute for Public Health, uh, Abby Charles and Mike Royster. So we really couldn't do this without those partners. So again, once we settled upon some of the core, the core challenges and needs and opportunities within a community, we had to also understood that there are data silos that often pop up for communities. And how do we then, you know, we may have different, uh, you know, platforms we're using now, PAL, Unite Us, different ways in which we're collecting data because we know it's there. How are we then able to break down silos across those um, varied institutions in a way that sort of protects uh, information of and sort of honors the, the privacy needs of folks in communities, but really to make sure there's that flow of communication. And our partners, uh, Anna Barnes and Peter Eckert of uh, the Illinois Public Health Institute and Data Across Sectors for Health really began to help us unpack some of those questions. And if we can go to our next slide. I mean, again, hopefully when you see all these partners, you see the collaborative approach at play here. We'll continue to talk about some of those exciting collaborations. The next focal area was really sustainability. So you have the right partners in play. You're, you're threshing out these issues, really thought about data, how we're making impact, how we're sharing that in some ways that we wanted to, we really wanna make sure they show up for our community. But we understand that a big part of the sustainability of this work is the sort of people power that needs to be in play and that we have solid plans, but also really that we've thought about the value that we present to the multiple sectors that are interested in this issue. Again, starting with community and radiating out. What is the value that we provide? Social return on investment for folks and those folks who are investing dollars into this, um, into these efforts because we would do it for free, certainly. We know each of our partners, but the work does take an ongoing way to think about building our capacity in ongoing ways and our people power. Some of the folks that help us to think about that uh, were, were Catherine Wright uh, at, the, at the Fannie E. Ripple Foundation. Again, you'll see, one of the themes you'll see is heaven and earth. So I want to give a special sh shout out to Sherry Mediato, who was one of our key partners who helped us to think about moving this work forward. But again, within this band of work, we really asked ourselves in the groups, what does sustainability look like to you? What are you trying to sustain? What's the value you provide? And how can we get some tools in your hands to help you talk to a range of funders? And sometimes it even looked like individual stakeholders, right? Because you're at the work. Have you begin to step away and celebrate your success even while you're so busy doing all this hard work? Um, we wanted to make sure that that value was clear and we help folks move forward in that way. And then again, in that same sustainability conversation, after you've really thought about the value and what sort of the mechanisms there, do we really on an ongoing way have the tools in place um, to help build the capacity of our network partners? Shameless plug here, we do have a toolkit that we'll also be rolling out to the field, an integrators toolkit that we hope some folks here might find a value because we understand that as you come back to healthcare, which is our, the world we're living in, we know it's not always so easy to say, hey, what's that network? I know you're spending time there. You, you might be in three or four networks. How do you really differentiate that value and begin to talk about um, the work and the importance of it. One of my favorite topical areas of our work is we're not unicorns. And I got to give a shout out to our colleagues, Greg Paulson and, and, Eric, and Dr. Eric Schwartz there at the Trenton Health Team and Capital Health that really begin to say, you know what, as we scan the field and this, hopefully some folks on the line can relate to this, we believe we do what we do well, but there isn't just one secret. There is a secret sauce that has many ingredients. We're not like, you know, there's not proprietary. So we'd love to share it. But what we found that many of the experts said, hey, listen, we want to talk this through. Um, we want to talk about how we maybe are a bit older than you. Maybe that we're that older sibling, we're that sort of near peer doing more work, but that really the coaching was in the spirit of, I think, exploration. And as teams were learning, our partners were certainly continuing to learn um, with, with the folks that they were coaching and learning from. So this leaders and learners motif was something that was really important for us. And we're not unicorns reflects the fact that we're doing it well, we're proud, but we're not unicorns. Uh, we think you can join us here. If so, we're a collection of unicorns because it really helped our colleagues um, and, and, the, and the team see that they could do this work too. And, and if we can sort of go and take a look, 
we want to give a shout out and just sort of name and claim the individual networks um, and collections of partners that really brought the work forward. So we're excited to see that these were networks from across the country. There were um, urban networks there. There were networks that represented some rural communities, East, East Coast, West Coast, and, and, and down in the South. And so I wouldn't, didn't want to read any more slides, but I want to just give a quick rapid fire shout out to some of those folks. Um, Bridgeport Pro prospers up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And one, some of the resources that we shared really celebrate the success successes and really name the networks there. So I would encourage you to look at the chat to learn more. And we're happy to talk about any more examples a little bit later in my part of the presentation and in our um, a question and answer together. Another group, DC Health Matters Collaborative, right down in Washington, DC, um, who are really looking at some of the challenges and opportunities for families there. We'll dig a little bit more into some of the spe specific areas of TA that these groups were interested in. First Thousand Days, Sarasota County, um, really looking at some birth to three, birth to five issues that exist and opportunities for young people down in Sarasota County, Florida. Get Ready Guilford, a similarly situated collaborative, but that are looking at some of those same issues for families across Guilford County, North Carolina. Um, help me grow Ventura County, thinking about there out in Ventura County, California, the ways in which they could think about their value proposition um, for, for local payers and the community out there in California. Very regional flavor to our California groups. Groups that were dug right in there in Los Angeles, working with folks um, who, with some particular you know, needs around sort of domestic violence issues um, and, and others for um, single moms down there in Los Angeles, really did great work. Um, the Maternal Mental Health Coalition, really thinking about some issues for our, our, our friends out in rural communities out in Flathead County in Montana. Um, and the last two that we list here, Partners for a Healthier Patterson, some folks right in our collective backyards here on, in the mid-Atlantic um, in the Northeast, and some of the work that uh, and opportunities for folks in Patterson, New Jersey, um, when you really think about sort of brick and mortar issues for folks in Patterson, as well as Shars with Drive um, in Philadelphia. And again, just really excited about the mix of sort of zero to five, zero to eight sort of issues, folks that are thinking about rural and um, urban communities, and also folks that are thinking about brick and mortar social determinants of health, how do we meet those needs while we certainly care for the uh, health and wellness of communities in ways that some of us in healthcare might, might more immediately recognize. So we will, yeah, and as we continue to move on, I'm so glad to talk about some examples from the field. So we know at a high level, we're so proud of the work, but really as we lift up voices from the field, we also wanna give you some more concrete examples of what made us so thrilled to be working with these folks. Um, we're, we're big fans of, we love us in Bridgeport, if I could speak in, the, in those terms. So why don't we go ahead and listen to another one of our colleagues from Yale New Haven Health, who really talked about the ways that this conversation sort of zeroed in and helped healthcare itself to sort of think differently um, about integrative activities and the central role healthcare can play in advancing health and wellness. I would say, you know, integrate or just that, integrate. So we are at a point in our society where we no longer see healthcare, social needs as separate. They are linked. So that integrator work just becomes more and more valuable because I'm not a healthcare provider anymore. I am a person who looks at health and well being in the community. And again, that's our friend Nancy Hampson, who works with Yale New Haven Health and works under. Uh, a broader uh, health enhancement community as a partner uh, with Bridgeport Prospers in Connecticut and Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, and again, we, we, we know we can't share this whole menu with us because it was really the process. We would love to show you all the worksheets, but it really took some good time and several conversations with teams to really begin to unpack and figure out what is that right menu of opportunities that the teams needed and that they self-directed us and, and helped us to decide where they need to really focus the resources um, on to really move this work forward. So even though you see these sort of uh, in this order. This is not a linear process. And so if I can be a little bit nimble, want to jump around and just highlight, you know, we'll talk about each of these in just a moment in turn, but really wanted to focus in on some of the ones that really popped up for us in this work. So this is an animated slide. So why don't we start with continuous use of the health equity lens? So in several cases, you know, no one in our groups would not uh, say that they have privileged health equity, but oftentimes groups need a way to think about how do we make bolder statements and take bolder stances, move towards reducing 
enhancing or advancing health equity um, or sort of reducing disparities to even making a broader, uh, take, putting a broader stake in, in, the, in the ground around what this could mean. So a big part of continuous use of health equity lens was making sure that it's infused in the work, that folks were empowered and partners were empowered to take bold stances um, within this work. And oftentimes folks are working across states that might be what you consider purple, right? Not just red or blue, folks may come from different places. So how are we making sure we're getting on the same page, being bold, looking at the same sets of data, maybe from different perspectives, but really making sure that that was infused in the work. Um, another key element of this work, at, you know, beyond continuous youth of health equity lens was really governance and leadership issues. These are these sort of, we have the integrative activities, these make sense, but on the ground, you may have a steering committee and a community advisory committee, you have multiple sectors coming together. So what are the approaches to network governance um, that really allow us to both sort of mine the store, if you will, there's not one group looking at this, but how do we have a governance structure that is nimble, it's flexible, but that it also really supports folks who are uh, implementing aspects of this work on the ground. And then really, you know, what is the network leadership approach that you need to be able to take a project, you know, a sort of an idea, and then begin to think about what is needed at the high level to sort of have guide rails, but let, make sure the folks who are on the ground working have the support they need to really ramp up the work. I'm outside of those two elements of the integrative activities, for, which is also a part of the framework um, of our work at, that emerged as we as we um, grew in our work over the last two years. One is also continuous learning and improvement, right? So we have data, but not but data in the service of what? Um, you know, data to really make sure that we're taking the data we're getting that's flying fast. We understand these community contexts are changing rapidly, but are we able to continue to learn and grow and be agile? What some folks in our in our world may call failing fast, right? If something didn't really work, why not? How do we iterate and continue to make sure that we're doing the best for the community and being transparent with this data? And you'll also see this really idea, this idea of creating capacity building and improvement opportunities so that folks, again, are able to work across data silos, but also really able to use data in ways, you know, potentially using dashboards, taking data that comes that pops up, but really making sure that it's transparent with communities. We know this is something that we may be swimming in our own sector's data, but how do we then make sure that, that we're accountable to groups and how do we build the skill sets within our networks to share data in real time? Um, another area of this work beyond continuous learning and improvement um, was really the spread scale and sustainability effort. So again, all this exciting work is happening. What does it mean to responsibly sort of share what we've learned here, make sure community has a chance to understand what's working, but there were so many cases and some of what we'll share and successes are that, you know what, we go from a bridge port, what is the larger region looking at? What are the statewide pieces? How do we inform larger conversations, but really staying true to the very local flavor that we know is so essential for making this work go? And again, you know, we, we see innovation and oversight. So that hopefully throughout all of this, we'll know that innovation and oversight becomes a way that we don't just want to innovate for innovation's sake, but that when things are new, we learn about them, we test them, you know, how are we making sure that there really is that back and forth between the management function and, you know, on the ground and the folks that may be providing governance and fiscal um, oversight of an individual project. Um, outside of this sort of model, we wanted to just zero in a little bit on what were teams specifically doing? You might say, that sounds great. What, what did it feel like? What did it look like within the lab? And so we just give you a little sampling. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this work, but for each of these teams, I wish one of our colleagues um, who is not here, two of our colleagues that do a lot of our work, when you go to the links, we hope you will take a look at, we'll see that each of these teams has a state profile. You begin to see some of the near-term lab, lab related goals, and then really lifting up some of the chief achievements that uh, teams were able to uh, gain from their time with us. And we're so excited to jump into some of the success stories because it really, you know, without teams on the ground and knowing that this work was landing there, then we're really just sharing exciting, um, exciting frameworks. And as one of our colleagues reminded us, if frameworks are like toothbrushes, we all have one, but nobody is necessarily keen on using anyone else's. So, um, if, you know, I'll, I'll sort of let that settle, but we know that a framework is just that, right? If it doesn't work for me very locally, then it may not really be something something I want to use. Um, two, of the, two, of the, two of the sort of broad areas of this work that we saw some exciting 
um, success successes come from was this idea of prioritizing equity and moving from concept to practice and widening leadership tables. So I think I mentioned and sort of teased this, but in that area of prioritizing equity and moving from concept to practice, we know folks wanted to be bolder. Folks wanted to meet the moment even before the pandemic, but certainly what got opened up there, folks said, hey, we need to take, we need to sort of help the field understand what uh, e health equity means and reducing disparities. We want to move one next step there. Um, but we also, that, that sort of concept to practice, folks needed some tools, which my um, esteemable colleague Kate will share a little bit, but maybe if I can tease one of those and look at the top example we have in Guilford County, North Carolina, one of the tools that, you know, Kate will talk a little bit about is this sort of health equity sort of health equity impact review tool. So when you're really on the ground with it, this, this opportunity with Guilford was a chance for the Institute for Public Health to come together to say, for, Institute, uh, for Public Health Innovation to come together with Guilford to say we've got about 90 to 100 partners met over a series of a couple of days to figure out whenever we're using this, whenever we're making the bold statement of something like reducing health disparities for, for infants, and fam infants and their families in Guilford County, a county that may have multiple demographics, political persuasions, that's a bold goal. But what does it mean for us to bring that to the ground? So over the course of this lab, Guilford was both able to sort of move this bold goal forward, but we're able, were able to use those tools with IP PHI to say, how does equity show up for us? What are the kind of hard conversations we need to have together to make sure we're on the same page about equity? But given that we do then agree and we do that hard work, how do we know when equity pertains in our community? How do we know that each of the policy agenda items that we have is really not going to necessarily amplify harms to community? And so they were able to develop uh, models that they're still testing now, and IPHI has continued to work with them to think about what this looks like um, moving forward. So it wasn't just that nine months, it was an ongoing relationship that we set, sought to um, sort to develop there and foster in our work. Another one was this idea of widened leadership tables. Sometimes groups had to ask the very tough question of who is the right who is the right group to lead this work? How do we, what we call step up and step back within this work? Even if there's large institutions such as healthcare, um, large education institutions, public health departments, sometimes groups had to ask that tough question around widening the leadership table might mean we actually step back. We can't sort of disengage from conversation. We need to step back. One of the really, one of the most powerful examples of this work came in, in Flathead County County's Department of Public Health, where they said, you know what, part of their work in Maternal Mental Health Coalition led them to realize we're not the best group to run this. So we want to, we won't call it devolvement because devolvement almost seems like a step down. It was really finding new partners from community CBO leaders that then took over this work. And then they stepped back and said, we'll support you and give you a push. And so we'd like to take full credit for that. I think they're already thinking in that direction, but it was amazing to see a group like the Maternal Mental Health Coalition have a seamless transfer of their their, uh, that group's power and begin to push forward what is needed for um, mothers there who are facing maternal sort of perinatal mood disorders and really having folks on the ground who've been there that can really lead the work there in that regard. Um, one last set of examples comes in, again, uh, sort of thinking about moving from equity, uh, what we know, to really data and what we need to do with this data. How do we then help turn what go from what one of our colleagues, uh, Nancy Hampson a little bit earlier, called moving from data to information. So oftentimes we know who the holders of information are. They have sort of advanced systems, ways of sharing this. But really, if you don't go from that sort of data to information, um, you really don't necessarily know how the data shows up in the world. And one way is in which the health enhancement community in Bridgeport did that was really some of the work, you know, some of the sort of what might seem like in the weeds sort of work, but a lot of that was getting developing new um, MOU sort of memorandums, understanding agreements so that this group of folks can then take the health improvement Alliance and take the Br Bridgeport prospers, which are two different entities and really come together under the health enhancement community. And you can imagine some of the challenge when you have dozens of CBO community based organizations led by the United Way and, and, and dozens of healthcare providers, right, that need to come together and figure out all the thorny issues around protecting, you know, um, health information for for uh, for patients, but also the sort of really understanding how do you have a community-driven approach that allows us to be transparent with data. Some of the things we saw there were really exciting was the sort of reframing of a CHNA and bringing folks in on the ground, community health workers, and really having a wide table. So you'll see the influence of other aspects here. That widened table showed up again when folks were able to take this data, ask community what it means, and then to make sure that that, that community led um, the, the latest community health needs assessment 
um, for the community and really thought about ways forward. And if I could sort of bundle this idea about expanded reach and external funding and resources, we understand again that it's super important for groups to have the resources in an ongoing way that they need to continue this work. But also what the COVID pandemic opened up was a greater desire on the parts of many um, county state governments to sort of think about the ways in which the sort of social determinants of health, multiple pre-existing conditions for communities, and some of the brick and mortar issues that showed up in communities, that there really wasn't this, this clear line between health and the other needs that arose in community. So part of what our, some of what our partners were able to do was expand their reach to take on positions of additional prominence, not for their own sake, but to really sort of be flag bearers for this work. One great example was the elevation of our colleagues at Sarah Sorota Memorial Hospital who ran the, um, the first thousand day Sarasota effort. They were brought in to really be a, a, a key leader in the plan of safe care for the entire Sarasota County. So this includes just more than what's happening in the hospital system for children and families, but really to understand what are the sort of ways in which we really can make sure that we have proven interventions across Sarasota County, which some may see outside of the purview of a hospital system, but Sarasota Memorial knew better and they were able to raise that, that banner. And the last thing I would point to here is that the CARES Act dollars in Patterson. So we saw not only just additional exciting ways that funders and external resources were brought to bear, we also saw partners step up in new ways to blend, to not blend, to blend and braid funding that came through the federal system. So we did see our partners and uh, partners in Patterson come together to utilize federal CARES Act dollars to support this kind of cross-sector work that was focused on housing as a social determinant of health for Patterson residents, along with St. Joseph's Hospital, who then had to take a little step back, but they certainly took the lead when you're thinking about healthcare. So hopefully you can see by my excitement and the examples of success here um, that really folks were taking the lead and able to do quite a bit in the nine months that we had together. I now have the pleasure of sort of handing the baton um, to, my, to my friend and colleague, Kate Blackburn, to talk a little bit about you know, where this work went and um, to really drill down further into some of the case studies and really looking, really looking forward to chatting with everyone in the Q&A. All right, thanks, Bilal. It's it's always hard to follow Bilal because his energy level is through the roof, and I <laughs> can't compete. All right, well, so let's move on. Um, I'm going to take us into a case study because when, in our prep for this, we thought like all of these bits and pieces are great, but it would be really useful, probably we hope, to all of you to see how does it fit together. So we're going to take us into that. But before we dive into that. I'm going to show our fourth and final clip, and this one is from Hana Hamdi, um, who's part of, who's a member of the Partners for a Healthier Patterson, Patterson, New Jersey. And here, Hana is reflecting on how use of that equity impact tool that Bilal talked about earlier has helped shift the language and intentionality across their network, not only within the partnership that we were supporting, but how they're using it um, in other partnerships and even in their work nationally. There's some palpable changes within the language that we use in our organization. So we're now, you know, intentional about saying that we're going to invest in black and brown communities and low income communities and indigenous communities, right? Why is that important? Because unless you name it, you cannot measure it, you don't know the impact, right? And so I've been beating that message since that training we had in Philadelphia. So we're grateful for that tool. And we use that tool across our partnerships um, nationally and within New Jersey. All right, that was great. Okay, so we're gonna move into this case study. Um, and we're gonna focus on Bridgeport Prospers who Bilal mentioned, we chose them somewhat arbitrarily, but also because they had three sort of focal areas and we wanted to give you a sense of how that worked. So they, um, the, what does this alignment to look like? Uh, what does it really look like? The priorities that each one developed, these the teams developed their priorities after doing a baseline assessment. It was like a network self-assessment of the integrative activities. So 
which integrative activities did they feel like they already had in place? Which did they not have in place? Which were they like, oh, if we did this better, we could really get a lot more traction. So everybody began as we onboarded the networks, everybody completed a network self-assessment. And then kind of when we came together in Philadelphia, actually at the meeting that Hannah referenced in the clip we just shared, we asked them to really think about it, but not to focus, not to choose their TA selection um, based on where they where they scored themselves as like not really working on those areas yet or not being as strong in those areas, but to really think about that alignment. And I think that's really key here. So they looked at their strategic plan, they looked at their work plans, whatever, however they wanted to think about it, and they looked at the integrative activities and thought about which of these items if we were to use it more deliberately, more strategically, maybe brought in a new key partner, which of these by focusing on them have the biggest ability to really push our work forward? And so that, um, we during that Philadelphia meeting, we, we thought about these things um, with the networks, with the faculty, with the folks running it from Nemours. We all had thought about it together. And then we went from these priorities into, really setting up their technical assistance plans. So the priorities for Bridgeport Prospers were leadership and engagement. They really wanted to focus on an MOU that formalized the partnership. And there's a lot of acronyms in here between Bridgeport Prospers and their, um, oh gosh, what's HIA? Health Improvement, I forget the A. So they were really focused on that. They were really bridging, they needed an umbrella that would bring two pre-existing networks together, common goals, common funding, all of that. Um, they wanted to look at continuous improvement in that subcategory. They wanted to create those data sharing agreements. So the client level data, um, I think there's a question in the chat about data sharing. This is client level data sharing. And then they also wanted to look at population level data across Bridgeport Prospers and the HIA networks. And then under equity, they were specifically interested in using our equity tools from our, our faculty that were in that area in conjunction with their community consultants. And they wanted to relook at their network plans to see if they were really, I'm gonna say like doing right and getting the voice of the community as they were considering their plans. So that were that's what they chose to focus on. Um, and then we turned it into a TA action plan. So each group could get up to 10 hours of TA-ish, that was flexible, but roughly 10 hours. So this is sort of how we chose to break it out. So we um, planned out that they would get somewhere in the ballpark of three hours from the folks at DASH, um, Data Across Sectors for Health, and then specifically the all-in Data for Community Health uh, folks that are part of DASH. Um, their second area was gonna be a roughly three hours of TA from Visible Network Lab around um, that network assessment tool. So like who's in our network? Is it about having maximum numbers of partners or is it about having the right number of partners and who do we need at the table? All of that kind of stuff. The third area that they agreed to focus on was um, around that the equity tools. And there they worked with the Institute for uh, Public Health Innovation. So we wanted to then in the next couple to just talk about the TA planned and the TA received. So um, again, for that data assessment piece, what was really great, and I wanna emphasize this, is that although our intent was to be very tool-based and action-oriented, that didn't mean that every single time we met with them, it was like, you have to use this tool to go through it. Some of the richest and most valuable technical assistance that we provided was through these sort of we're not unicorn conversations where we, we got some of our networks in conversation, like brokered conversation with other people in the network that we at Nemours didn't know, weren't connected to. So, um, our colleagues at All In Data for Community Health brokered some really, really rich conversations where they got two or three different organizations that had already handled all of these challenges that Bridgeport were focused on, got them on the phone, talked through like really in the weeds content, and those connections remain. So I think that was a really rich and valuable piece of the TA there. So you can see how that looked. Um, in terms of the network assessment, Visible Network Labs did two training and applied learning sessions for the folks at Bridgeport. So in the first one, um, it were two different groups of people in each one, and I have a typo, it says brining, not bringing, sorry. Um, network analysis, the first one was a network analysis to bring 
those two pre-existing pre -existing networks together. So like who would be in the, under this new umbrella? What would that look like? Who needed to step up? What roles would everybody take? Really in the weeds. And then the second one was around mapping existing data silos and network connections needed to remove them. So um, this hopefully, let's see. It looks like my links aren't going to work. Sorry, hang on. Yeah, they worked when we tested, but I'll show I'll go later in the Q and A if we have time. But and and all of the links that um, Blau or, or Allison put into the chat, you can get directly into our collection of tool and resources, and you can see this sample tool here. So um, one of the tools that was really popular in all of the groups that we used for the network mapping was a tool called Who's in Your Network? Thinking Like a Network Scientist. I'm sorry that I can't show that to you right this second, but hopefully I can in the discussion. Um, and then in terms of the TA planned related to equity, our colleagues um, from the Institute for Public Health Innovation worked with it and did a training and learning session on establishing a common understanding of health equity and using an equity impact review tool within network workflows. And what I think was really interesting about that was that the folks at IPHI started very high level. What is equity? Okay, how do you how do you anchor that? What does that look like? If you want to do equity in your network, what does that mean? And so then they sh then they oriented everybody to this tool and then they practiced using it based on a policy that either the network already had in place or is considering using. And they they helped them practice that skill and as a result, the networks that worked with IPHI as their faculty, not just Bridgeport, but others, um, have embedded use of this tool and other similar tools into their day-to-day -day decision making, um, committees, their whole network workflows, so that when they say like, what is equity and how are we doing it? It's really, really, really down and all throughout their networks um, in terms of day-to-day -day operations. So, um, I guess on this one, I just, Bilal already showed this slide, but I wanted to bring it back and show it to you again. So um, the details, this slide details the achievements that were supported by the technical assistance from the learning lab. So you can see that if, if you look at the bullets, I'm not gonna read it to you, on the blue side, they really did do the things that they set out to do and then some. So they brought together those two existing networks under one umbrella. They formalized that MOU and their data sharing agreements. They revised their approach to the data collection analysis. They incorporated the use of that equity impact review tool in their daily flow. Um, and then I think what's really interesting is that there's some things that they didn't, we didn't in set out to do, but they were like serendipitous and they come from the synergy of working together. So they realized that they could talk about being part of a national learning and action collaborative and that that would be something that was interesting that they could put into award applications, funding applications, things like that. And they also realized that they needed to change their theory of change. Um, and so we worked with them and did some extra coaching around the original plan on that. So. I hope that that case study, though it was quick, gives you an idea of how we went from, these are the integrative activities, this is how we think we're doing with them, these are the coaching areas that we can get to what happened and what, what impact did we make. Um, so let's see what else do we wanna say here. So in terms of spreading and scaling, I think what's really important to us is that we recognize that we worked with nine communities across the country. That's not that many. So we're very interested in how can we take what we learned and share it with the field at large so that somebody who's never heard of Nemours or the Integrator Learning Lab can you know, benefit from this knowledge. So one of the tools that we released today, and you have the links to in the slide and in the chat, is this collection of tools and resources from the lab. And it's broken down, it's organized into the categories that we, um, how we kind of, um, the topics that we use to organize our technical assistance. Each one is hyperlinked, each one, you can see if it's a tool and it's very action oriented, you could see if it's a presentation, so you can skim and quickly for what you want. Um, and so everything that we did in, one-on-one -on -one TA with the networks. And then when we would have all network meetings when everybody was together, whether virtually or in Philadelphia, everything that we used is in here. And I think about when I was more in community networks as a person that 
didn't have the time, didn't have the resources, didn't wasn't part of a learning collaborative. I tried to put together, we tried to put together the team, something that would be really valuable to that person. So I hope that um, you all explore it and I hope that you share it and I hope that the, you know, the field finds it to be useful. So that's that. And we're super excited to chat about this with anybody that wants to chat with us about it. So, <laughs> um, and then the other piece that I would say in terms of spreading and scaling is we realized that there was a gap um, we did put together the collection of what's there, but we also realized that there was a gap and that there were some, some pieces of, of tools that we felt like we didn't see in the field maybe, or we just wanted to refine them to go along with our work. So we created what we called an integrators toolkit, five tools for helping networks turn big ideas into action. And so those five tools are around inventorying your integrative activities, aligning them, um, network values, you can see the topics here. Anybody's interested in learning more about that, it's in beta testing form. It's not pretty, um, it's on Google Drive, so it's not ready for the field, but we're interested. We currently are beta testing it, using it in the field. Anybody's interested, we're happy to have you look at it, happy to have you use it, happy to provide some consult before you use it, any of that. Um, so our email is there. If you're interested, please follow up. That'll get to all of us. So quickly, the takeaways here. Um, I think being disciplined about creating the dedicated time and space to consider integrative activities is the real key, right? So I think all of us know, like this is, Bilal talked about the secret sauce before in the, the, in the unicorn conversation. This is not like rocket science. It's about the alignment, like carving out that dedicated time. Um, so start at the beginning, assess and realign, revisit regularly, like think about your integrative activities as part of your strategic plan. Um, and then support for big ideas, community, um, big ideas is insufficient, right? So if you just like, yes, we believe that community led network supported goal setting is important, or we believe in health equity, or yes, we believe that it's important to be able to talk about your value in really clear terms. Those big ideas are great, but they're not gonna really get your front line there. So um, we really are encouraging people to think about tools that they can use to operationalize big ideas and turn them into action. Um, and then there was four things that we really found to be true across all of the networks um, in terms of being elements that were essential for success as population health integrators. So um, I'm gonna skip them just cause I'm looking at the time and I wanna get to Q and A, but they're here and you all can read. So that's really it. Let's stop here and go into Q and A. And I'm gonna stop sharing cause I haven't been able to see any of you the whole time. Okay, there we go. How do we want to go for Q and A? Alina, so, are you? I yeah, I can I can read the couple of questions that have Great. come in. Um, the first one was, how did the project define or describe equity as a concept? And I think it was addressed to Bilal. Great. Now, and if anyone here, you know, we'll do a quick fire challenge uh, for all of our top chef folks out here. But yeah, equity in general, you know, it is a very difficult concept and we, there isn't one definition there, but you know, I think we we often use the, uh, the one that I was most accustomed to is the idea around a just and fair sort of opportunity to live a healthy life, which I know comes through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I think when you think about fair and just, it's that sort of idea when you see the kids standing over the fences and sort of what's the opportunity, but if everyone really needs the same thing in health and we understand social determinants of health being in these five broad areas, who's furthest from sort of those needs and then really infusing the resources that they all need to get to that one shared place. And I think one last thing I'll say in front of my colleagues after this is that not having a medicalized, it really was important for a non-medicalized vision of health and wellness that came up really early. So leading with what community sees for itself Real, asking how far we are away from that in these various areas and then figuring out who's furthest from that so we know how to deploy our resources um, in an equitable manner um, was a big part of it for us. Great, thank you. And a second question was about data. Is data sharing around patients, not just data sharing, but part of the vision? Uh, for example, as could be done with personal health records. Do you want me to take that? <laughs> it seemed to be a sure. Spring, go ahead. Springing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think that was that. I would say that that was very network by network in our experience. Um, for most, they were looking at a really broad definition 
of community health and wellness. So they were looking at really broad measures, but then they were also pairing that back and drilling down. And so for most, I think that um, where health care organizations, um, community health centers, that sort of thing, um, were involved, they were looking at data sharing, or if, if it wasn't, if, if they were focused, let's say, on early childhood, maybe it was more around childhood readiness, but they were looking at those that they served, whether they be patients, whether they be children and families, et cetera, but they were looking at individual level outcomes as well as those bigger, broader measures. So I would say that they were stratifying and looking at big as well as little. That's great, thank you. Um, I don't see another question, but I had a question too. I think yeah. I heard you talk about medicalization and I think we've all seen um, articles in the journal literature over the last couple of years about the relationship at the interface of healthcare and the social sector and the fact that there's an asymmetry there, um, obviously in power, but primarily re related to resources. Um, because the social sector is often just scrambling to, to get resources together um, and healthcare is often pretty robustly funded. So the question is how, how did that aspect or any other aspects of that, those two sort of cultures and sectors coming together um, get, how did they arise and how did they get sort of addressed or resolved? Thank you. Sure, um, thanks Elena. I think that um, it was actually a very important part of these conversations about where does healthcare lead and where does healthcare step back? Um, and stepping back does not mean not creating resources or dedicating resources or time to it. It just means um, figuring out what the best role is to play. And we actually explored that in a couple of our documents that came out around this, especially in um, the one that we covered in the last um, webinar that we did with you all, but really focused on this idea of What's the key area where healthcare can make a um, important play? How do we come into, and I say we, because we are healthcare at Nemours, how do we come into situations um, and not sort of know the answer, rather look to the communities and serve the communities that we're with um, in order to make those, those changes happen? So I think it's really a combination of looking across, you know, what the data is, what the, the resources are, et cetera, and coupling that with deciding um, how community voice and experiences are gonna be incorporated. How are social services voice going to be incorporated and interested in integrated? And I think the biggest thing is remembering so many of us serve the same families and children. So how do we put them at the center of what we're doing and create systems that serve them versus serving the systems that we're creating? Excellent points, thank you. Um, I see another question and that's how you differentiate between wellness and well-being. I guess that's addressed to all of you. I don't know if we have, <laughs> frankly, I, I feel like they're not, we don't have a strict definition, but if somebody else has one in their head, like I see them as interchangeable terms, but maybe I'm way behind the field on that. All right. I think the, the point about language is so important and we appreciate yeah. all the questions that have come in around language, yeah. um, both this and in the chat in terms of unicorns and remembering that words mean different things to different people. And I hearken back to one of our colleagues who spoke at the beginning of this via um, uh, the, the JPEG or the GIF or whatever we call them, um, but really adding to the fact that what we're trying to do is align on language and understanding that while well-being and wellness might mean the same thing to us, it doesn't mean the same thing to another colleague sitting at the table. So how do we bring those up into conversation? How do we work through it when we're integrating in communities? And how do we give value to both of them um, and to understand what everyone's bringing to the table so that we can move the work forward? I think it's a great question and a great reminder of the importance of language. Awesome. Uh, another question is uh, about the integration of healthcare with social service and community-based organizations. We talk about this a lot. Where do you see public health in this coming together of all of these different uh, stakeholders? Um, I keep jumping in and waiting for my colleagues to say the same thing, but I'll start. Um, public health to me is an integral part in the communities that we're, we're talking about serving and they serve an important role um, as we think about children and families or communities in general. And so having them at the table, having their voice at the table, um, I think is a, is a critical partner to be there. 
Um, and the more we can do that, the more we normalize that, the more we think about that, especially from the great perspective that public health brings about how to bring in um, continuous funding, how to bring in governmental funding, how do you create government services, how do we link those to public-private partnerships? I think they bring a, a an incredible um, depth of knowledge and expertise that may be lacking in other areas that could really be leveraged and serve the groups that we're trying to serve. And Alina, I know we're right at time, but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say I think what Kate had started to allude to around really what some of the fancier folk may be calling upstream, you know, if we can consider ourselves upstreamists, right, and really want to make systems change. I think public health, when you're thinking about having to change systems and understanding who holds data of certain types, if you don't really, you know, public health also allows us to have the view of the whole of a largest uh, sort of aggregate level data, right? But if we're not disaggregating that and going down to the level of understanding where, the, where there are sort of gaps in that data where individual populations maybe aren't faring as well as others, right? I think it's this unique, it's really an interesting interplay Play, who holds the data, whose voices are heard, and then if we're all going to collectively go and report out to the state senate, if we're going out to do the work around systems change, if you need community organizations on the ground advocating, really you need all those partners there if you're really thinking about the type of system change that we're working towards. Mm -hmm. So going midstream, co-locating work, important, making those warm handoff and connections, but really see public health playing a role in that broader systems change um, effort that it's going to take to get this work done. So that's one area I also saw. That's that's terrific. I, I realize we're we're really sort of running late, and we did have one more question, but I don't think we'll have a chance to to get to it. But I did want to say I, I noticed that um, Kate had put her email in in there, but I think it was just addressed to the panelists in response to a question. So if you want to get a hold of any of our speakers, uh, just reach out to me. It was on the announcement about this event, or or email that general um, Nemours um, email address that was provided. I think that was. Um, I'm going to ask my colleague Harika if she could see if that was uh, shared with everyone or just the panelists. Um, and um, Alina, can I jump yes. in and say one thing? Sure thing. Yep. I was sharing that there was somebody that had specifically asked a question like two or three up about the fragmented community, tribes, county health, et cetera, mm -hmm. and they couldn't get them in the room. So absolutely no running along, but I have some really specific ideas about that. So please email me. Um, and our email address is in the slide deck. So when you share them with everybody, they'll get our email addresses. That yeah, way we'll, well. Put it, we'll put it there and the archive video as well. And awesome. I, Harika just shared the, that general email address as well. So that's true. Thank you so much to the three of you. You've just been yes. amazing, you know, just crunching a ton of information <laughs> into the short time we had together. And thanks for everyone who, who joined us and asked all these wonderful questions. Um, so thanks so much. And uh, we'll, if you keep looking at the website, you'll see information um, on there. Someone would love to hear an answer to that last question. If you guys have one more minute and if people could stay on for one more minute. So last question. Great. Do you see this work impacting the community health infrastructure in any way, or is the impact more on the collaborative partners versus the systems they reside within? I think it has to change the systems. Um, I think that while it may start with the people who are around the table, the goal of this work is to really make system changes that can be impactful regardless of if the people around the table change um, or, or transfer or do something else. I think who is around the table is so important, getting things started and the relationships and all of that is critical. I think for sustainability purposes and moving this work forward in a coordinated and sustainable way, we really need to change the systems, the policies, the practices, the environments in which they exist in really structural ways um, to have the stickiness that we're trying to achieve. Very well stated, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. You've been just just terrific. Thanks for having us. We Thank you. Thanks everybody. to the National Academies for having us. Yes, definitely. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, y'all. Bye, everyone. <laughs>